மதிமுகம் தொலைக்காட்சியில விளம்பரம் கொடுக்க விரும்புறவங்க திரையில தெரியற எண்ணுக்கு தொடர்பு கொள்ளுங்க குட் ஈவினிங் எவ்ரி ஒன் அண்ட் தேங்க்யூ ஃபார் ஜாயினிங் அஸ் டுடே வெபினார் ஆன் ஃபெடரலிசம் இன் இந்தியா யூ ஹவ் சார்ட் ஆஃப் சீன் தட் டைட்டில் ஆஃப் திஸ் வெபினார் இஸ் இஸ் பார்ட் ஆஃப் த சீரீஸ் தட் வி அட் வெரி சென்டர் ஃபார் லீகல் பாலிசி ஆர் டூயிங் which is titled Constitu- conscience keepers the judiciary as the constitutional guardian you would have seen the title which is uh, federalism in india is it cooperative competitive or adversarial and that is something that we hope to discuss in the course of the next uh, 45 minutes to 1 hour or so uh, we also have with us uh, uh, dr pete yagarajan he is somebody who was was an elected mla in 2016 and serves on the public accounts committee in the tamil nadu state legislative assembly um, he is also someone who has had deep experience in international uh, uh, in working with global multinationals and has uh, worked in a lot of different countries in this capacity uh, he brings with him a rich experience of having worked on matters related to federalism and worked on matters concerning center state relations and he is somebody who uh, writes about and talks about he's also a spokesperson uh, for the dmk party uh, on largely issues of economic uh, on economic issues and so on uh and which is why we thought it would be great to have him on board with our webinar uh, welcome dr tyagaraj uh, it is it was very nice of you to agree to be on our webinar let us understand first and foremost that a federal country is not just a country where there are cent- where there is a center and there are states the constitution empowers the states on par with the center uh, those of us who are constitutional lawyers may used to make the argument that india was a quasi federal polity you know it's not really that federal because you would have those of us who have followed politics would know that uh, you know uh, state governments could be dismissed by the center the center could override and make legislation on topics in certain instances could make legislation and override state uh, powers and certain legislation in certain areas and there are there are a lot of ways in which the state can it's a, the center can sort of supersede the state in many ways in the last one year we have seen multiple issues of center state friction i'd like to call it we have seen a lot of center state <laughs> on four or five issues and this four or five issues is what i want to focus our discussion on um i uh, and two two of two of these are fiscal issues uh, one is related to the compensation granted in the context of uh, the gst uh, we have seen that the states are very upset that the center refused to give them compensation money that it had uh, that it that it said it couldn't afford to pay any more that it had promised in a law the center had promised in the law that states which uh, had uh, signed on to the gst would receive compensation at a certain fixed uh, percentage for the next 5 years the center said sorry that's not happening the second source of potential friction um, has been in the context of uh the uh, 15th finance commission now the report has been submitted uh, and uh, obviously we don't know the contents of the report uh but the main two main issues which have caused source of concern is on what basis forget about the percentage on what basis will money be uh, distributed between the states and also should the states be asked to pay for defense and internal security by creating a special fund we hope today to discuss what are the merits of these sides and which side should eventually prevail in this particular debate a third big issue has been over neat which is the national entrance come eligibility test for uh, medical students we have seen that states such as tamil tamil nadu have said that this is something which goes against the interests of the state and this is something that affects their students but we sort of want to go into why is the why, why is it that is is a decentralized way of testing a better way or is it a centralized way of testing which is a better way and what is the basis for this discomfort with the test a fourth issue which has and still we would say it's an ongoing issue is related to the three laws which quote unquote look to liberalize uh, the farming sector in the country uh, agriculture in under the constitution is a state subject which means that the state has exclusive power to make laws but we've seen the three major legislations have been passed by the center and we have seen that there have been strong protests against these legislations across the country a final issue is something that uh, has been commented upon is the covid uh, the effort to fight covid itself keep in mind when the who declared an inter- a pandemic breakout of a pandemic we didn't have any law which clearly told us what we should do or rather what the government should do to address a pandemic which is raging across the country what was instead done was the use of powers under the disaster management act to impose a lockdown and impose restrictions on what activities can and cannot be conducted 
But over the eight months that we have had experienced this lockdown, or seven and a half to eight months, we have seen that the center has changed its approach from a heavily centralized everything to be determined by the center to each state should figure out its own way. Each state should figure out how best to do it. Is it a question of the state center becoming wise to the actual challenges later, or is it that the center found the limits of its capacity? And you know, should should the center have necessarily imposed a lockdown? Is a question that people have asked and raised. What did it do to the federal structure of the country when directives were coming, directives were coming out from the Ministry of Home Affairs as to this shop should be open, this shop should not be open? These are some of the issues that we want to discuss today. And I, I want to start with Dr. Tyagrajan specifically on NEET and uh, also uh, on uh, perhaps the farm bills uh, to help us understand what is the essential basis for the discomfort for this. So I'll just make three or four points. As somebody who has run global businesses for large banks and has operated in many countries, I would first start with saying India is the most centralized, least devolved power large country in the world. Uh, if you look at the United States as one extreme and China as the other extreme in terms of capitalism and communism, both those countries delegate a lot of authority and a lot of rulemaking and a lot of governance down to the cities school boards, police uh, departments. In China, banking licenses are given by state. You know, in the US, the state election uh, process for president is run by the states and answerable in the state courts, not in a federal court. So, you know, we are about the only large country in the world where we have this delusion that a country of 1.38 billion people who are so vastly different uh, Bihar, where the average age is 19 and the per capita income is 50,000 and the average education is elementary school dropout, should be treated the same way in the same one nation, one X formula as a Tamil Nadu, where the average age is uh, 31 or 32, average education is high school graduate and per capita income is 2 lakhs plus. So I think it's a delusion. And every day in every way, we are finding that this delusion is uh, creating real bad outcomes for us. Now, as far as need goes, it is a black and white issue. If you want to run a central institute and you want to fund it, by all means, run whatever test you want. But if we are funding it 100% with our tax money, and as somebody who appeared before the 15th Finance Commission and uh, presented to Mr. N.K. Singh, I want to make the point that already the Finance Commissions of the last 25 years have been utter failures from a standpoint of federalism. If the idea is that better off, more developed states should contribute to nation building more and that therefore, like in China, like in Europe, like in America, the gap between the haves and the have-nots should narrow, we have failed miserably. With every decade, the gap has widened and widened and widened. So we used to pay a rupee in taxes from Tamil Nadu, we used to get back 65, 70 paisa. Now we get back 38. We are still substantially better in every measure than a Bihar that gets back four rupees and cannot pay its state wages the state employees wages unless it gets a central transfer. So in this uh, kind of trajectory, when we pay for our state education, which is so intricately linked to our public health model using our legislative assembly, and we have a track record that shows us as the best state in medicine in India. We have four doctors per thousand people. That's like six times better than the Indian average. Why do we believe the government of India has any either status, competence, or authority to tell us how we should run the medical colleges that we fund with our money for our students. It's a fundamental question. Moving on to the farm bills, I think we are now starting to see the breakdown of federalism. You know, as long as we had coalition governments or even the Congress governments, Congress-led coalition governments, who in their own way had this delusion of empire that they could run everything from Delhi rather than kind of devolve powers they were still within some limit of constraint. Now we have people whose psychology is that they are going to dictate to the rest of the country how it ought to be done when their own track record is miserable and far below the average for a place like Tamil Nadu. And so we are now seeing states simply refuse to go along. As you point out, many of these subjects are state subjects. I'm a sitting member of the assembly. We have commercial tax laws that we have to amend. If the GST council approves a new rate or a new methodology, we have to go and pass a bill. At some point, we're going to say it's this far and no further. Why do you keep dictating to us and we have to keep passing the bill? Let's see how the constitution actually breaks down or not. So I think we're reaching that stage 
where the states are unwilling to be kind of docile, silent partners where something is thrust upon them. And then we are expected to follow as if there's some all-knowing, all-seeing, benevolent dictator sitting in Delhi who can tell us how we ought to run our lives. I think, you know, we have a unanimous bill in the legislature twice in our Tamil Nadu assembly, twice saying that we don't want to run this test. And the president has refused to sign the bill. So I think we are reaching that point where uh, we should be worried about a serious breakdown because unlike most other countries, we have a huge discrepancy in India, in China or in Europe, or in the US. The states that have the highest populations also have the highest GDPs, mm. highest tax bases, highest contributions to the economy, highest net transfer payments. In India, we have the exact opposite. The states that have the highest uh, per capita GDPs and highest net contributions are the ones that have the smallest population because we got population under control. That's a kind of virtuous cycle because we got population under control, we grew fast. And so you're going to have this battle where uh, a kind of government that is elected by largely the kind of lower income, lower uh, education states is trying to impose its will on the higher income, higher education states. And there's, there's a breaking point. It's just not, uh, it's not possible to extend this uh, you know, uh, in one direction continuously. That's my view, at least to start. Sure. Thank you, sir. And that's a great point that you make, what you just said at the light part. I think uh, uh, a couple of economists have actually written about this phenomenon, and they call it the 333 problem, uh, where the three richest uh, states in India by per capita income, the three uh, richest states in India are three times more, uh, uh, three times richer than the three poorest states. So, which, which is probably, I think, Haryana, Punjab, and Gujarat are three times richer than uh, Bihar, Jharkhand, and uh, Chhattisgarh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but Mr. Jagarajan, just on a couple of points that you had made, um, I just sort of wanted to uh, push it further a little bit and get your uh, view on this. Uh, one very important point that you made was about the intricate linkage between the Tamil Nadu public health, sy health system and the need to have a certain kind of... Uh, what, what can we say, this um, uh, uh, medical health education, that one feeds into the other, that, that you, you, you've created an integrated way of tying, tying up medical health and education that allows for this kind of integration. Um, and that is something that you feel that need interferes with. Um, I just sort of, the first initial thing, not a lot of our listeners may be very aware of this. So if you could elaborate, us, uh, elaborate a little bit on that. And second, uh, don't you think, and, and just to pose the counter question, don't you think perhaps that to recreate something like this in another state which may not have a robust public health system, let's take a Bihar perhaps, that precisely more resources are needed to do it and therefore perhaps it may not be such a bad thing if more money is put into a state like Bihar to create this linkage between public health and uh, medical education. So just on these two quick points if you could respond. So I would say that uh, medical education is quite unique in the sense that you cannot create doctors without having hospitals. I, right. I, you know, I am an engineer, then an operations research major, then a PhD in psychology, then a finance major. I can study all these things without touching human beings. Maybe I have to do research on subjects. But you cannot be a doctor without having an attached hospital. And so it is crucial. And in, in a welfare state, one of the first services you want to provide to the people is free health or at least to the extent possible free health. So these are intricately connected to each other, down to the way we give preferences, the kinds of incentives we provide for serving in rural health, uh, primary health centers, and therefore getting a right to go to uh, uh, higher education and medicine. All of these have been intricately uh, kind of put together from 1920s. Let me be very clear. This oh, okay. started back in the 1920s when the first Justice Party government came under Dayaki. And mm -hmm. the Raja of Panagal passed a law removing Sanskrit as a prerequisite for studying medicine so okay. that you could widen the intake pipe and get all kinds of people in. So mm -hmm. partly because of our social justice model, partly because of the results, partly because, see, when you have reservations and you have quotas and all that, what does it do? Of course, it's short-term inefficient. Mm -hmm. But, and I'm a forward cast and I've suffered the consequences. But what it does is for people who have been oppressed, for people who have no examples for people who have no uh, guides to show them you can be like me you know mm. I'm, I'm a graduate of mit mm. at lehman brothers or a stanchard they would send me to mit to recruit not 
to Harvard, not to Stanford, because the power of saying to the MIT student, I was once like you, automatically hmm. tells him he can be like me and okay. he can be a managing director and make millions of dollars. So what the value of having an example in your community, in your society, in your neighborhood hmm. that we understand to be very powerful in overcoming the kind of structural hierarchies of caste and class and all that over centuries or thousands, millennia. So we have a system that we have fine-tuned and we have produced phenomenal results, much better results than any other state in India by far, at least as far as health is concerned. And certainly of a large state. Places like Kerala have slightly better numbers in like infant mortality, but they are a much smaller state than, uh, than us in size. So what we worry about is why should either the central government or the states, in fact, the broader concern I have since all of you are lawyers, is that the line between the judiciary, the administration or executive and the legislature seems to have been completely erased in the last four or five years. The mm -hmm. legislatures have become emasculated. You know, we are whoever ruling party runs, we all say, yes, sir, three bags full. Mm -hmm. And then the administration and the judiciary, the relationship has become much more kind of subservient and, and uh, kowtowing. And while I'm very happy to hear of the instances you gave where judges stood up for uh, states' rights and all that, my own experience as an MLA is that uh, five or six seminal cases to whether this government continues mm -hmm. and what is the right of a speaker compared to a right of an MLA have all mm -hmm. languished in the courts for years and years, four or five years without hearing. Yes. So, you know, our, like, if you ask me, do I have faith that the judiciary is the savior? I say absolutely not. We have lost that faith. We mm -hmm. assume that the will of the people is the only way we'll get out of a situation. And the mm -hmm. fact that the law is on our side has not really gotten us that great and advantage. So, so from that perspective, I, mm -hmm. I don't think it's, it's a logical outcome that somebody should dictate to us how we should run uh, medical education and public health because they're right. so intricately connected to each other. I am a patriotic Indian. In every federal structure, everywhere in the world, the better off states contribute to the less well off states. That happens in China, that happens in India, that happens in America, that happens everywhere. What we want is that the excess contribution over time narrows the gap, the rich and poor gap narrows. And so you don't have to have disparity. In India, we've been seeing the opposite. We've right. got a reverse situation. Nowhere right. in the world, I am a guy who has written multiple entrance exams myself. Hmm. Nowhere or oh, standardized tests or whatever these entry tests are. Nowhere mm -hmm. in the world is one test the sole basis for admission to anything. Okay. Not the MCAT, not the, I mean, I mean, in the US, not the medical college, not the MBA, not GMAT, not GRE, not LSAT, not nothing. The, in fact, many schools have stopped taking the test altogether because the bias of race and class and wealth has become so obvious that, for example, during the lockdown, the University of California, the largest public university system in the world, has said, we simply will not use it. For five years, we will not touch it. It will mm. not be a factor in admission at all. And we are trying to develop a test that can accommodate for those variations and still be a standardized test. If we get one in five years, we'll take it in five years. Till then, there is no standardized test. So why are we the only ones regressing backwards and saying that your whole future is dependent on the results of one test in one day? It is perverse and it is, you know, it is stress-inducing. We are seeing so many cases of suicide of people who have taken the test more than once before mm. and then find it unbearable that having taken a year or two of coaching to do the test again, they don't have the confidence they can clear it. And yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're taking their own life. So this kind of, uh, what can I say? Intrusion without sympathy, without compassion, without science, mm -hmm. with the global benchmark going the other way, mm. uh, we consider that to be extremely kind of unfair and unjust. Uh, but Mr. Tiagraj, one more point very quickly uh, that I sort of wanted your take on. Uh, in the context of the farm bills, um, I think uh, this, is, this is one of those things that as it's, I mean, it's continuing to see a lot of uh, the debate and a lot of uh, opposition to what the center has proposed. Um, but one school of thought holds that why haven't states taken the lead on this? Um, I, I know for a fact that Karnataka government has done a good effort job in kind of dismantling uh, the APMC, not dismantling entirely, but replacing it with something slightly better. There are, there are of course, people who say it works well and people who say it doesn't work well. Uh, but what, what do you think is something that the state can do to address some of the issues that farmers face 
you know, apart from, I mean, not to say that the opposition shouldn't be stopped, should be stopped or anything like that. They have a point of view; they should put it forward. Uh, but what can the state itself do to push forward, say, farmers' uh, uh, you know ability to make a proper livelihood for themselves uh, out of uh, farming? So, uh, at some level, I have deep background. Uh, my family has been in agriculture for 300, 400 years, so I feel like uh, you know I have some history. Of course, I'm not running the farm myself. Mm. But my my interpretation and my understanding is, if you take a look at Bihar, where the APFCs have been abolished for years now, they have mm. not been able to achieve the outcome of getting farmers' income increased mm. in a substantive way. So you have a system that is broken in many ways. If I take Tamil Nadu, from uh, water resource management to uh, fertilizer subsidy optimization to crop optimization to uh, marketing uh, channels. Mm. to the MSP, to monopoly procurement in the Kaveri Delta, whereas it's not in other places. There are a hundred ways where you can actually uh, make improvements, in my opinion. Okay. But you have okay. two or three little issues, or rather two or three structural psychological problems. The mm. first is none of these are going to be politically without cost. Like, okay. we, like uh, for example, we give free electricity to farmers. That's a mm. Tamil Nadu thing. Mm. But I have evidence that shows that, uh, let's say, uh, about 50 to 50 lakhs to one crore a day of mm. electricity is stolen by people who ought not to qualify for that free electricity in my uh, Kambam Valley in Taini district alone because oh. they're running 50, 100 uh, horsepower motors sucking the water out of the river and doing kind of criminal things. So as much as it is about the law or the design, it is about the implementation and the discipline and the lack of corruption or the ability to actually enforce what laws you have. So I think that the first problem is this kind of, you know, tenuous uh, uh, corruption to uh, mafia uh, kind of link in many of these businesses. The second is there is a huge arbitrage between farm and folk. You know, the yeah. middle traders uh, have such margins that there is a massive lobby there and uh, it is as bad in North India as it is in South India. So these lobbies need to be kind of taken out of the system. And again, in a democracy, you will find that these lobbies will easily kind of, uh, what do you say, uh, subvert the process by lobbying with the resources that they have. Yeah. The third problem in particular with these farmers Sorry. and with, with the general approach uh, that yeah. I see in the whole kind of corporatization of India. Hmm. If the government of India cannot do it, and I'm a member of the PAC, today hmm. I have seen so many examples of hmm. the failure of central government schemes Mm. Uh, because the central government cannot implement it. It has to be implemented by the state or by a sure. municipality or a corporation or a panchayat with the oversight of the state. And there are so many ways this fails. So when you have this kind of a situation where even the central government cannot implement these things at a national level, why do you assume that a mega corporate like a, a Reliance or a, you know, a agro giant or a parley or a whatever can implement it? These are problems of complexity. I ran a large global banking business uh, with a $170 billion balance sheet across 60 or 70 countries. These are not things that are easy to do. And yep. that is when it's all professional, all digital, all mm. on online and real-time risk. Here you have thousand different languages, cultures, crops. I'm uh, on the uh, now. And so the odds that you can do this in a centralized way where one person makes a design or a decision and you can get it done is exactly zero. You okay. have to either incentivize or empower or hold the states accountable. Even I can live with that. But it has yeah. to be a cooperative process. You cannot okay. write laws in Delhi overnight yeah. without discussion and expect that the states will make them successes. You certainly cannot do it from Delhi, nor can your corporate partners do it. It's simply impossible. It cannot be done. Thank you. But this is a very interesting question asked by one Mr. Praveen Ravi. Uh, given that some benefits in better coordination on medical education uh, why is it that there have been so few examples of states coming together and coordinating on these matters without the center dictating uh, terms? And follow up with that, what will it take for states to provide a coordination based alternative to, like, say, central fiat? Uh, if, you, if, I, if you could just tell me, what, what are the issues with this kind? I mean, no, I, 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 I think that's a very valid question. So if you don't mind, though, you haven't asked me, I just want to make two, three uh, uh, quick points. Number one. Uh, Everything depends on your attitude and how you approach a problem. If mm -hmm. you call me and ask me for consultation and engage me in the process, I'm much like, more likely to go along with the outcome, even if it's marginally different from my perspective.
if you impose it on me with no forewarning with no input with no kind of uh, uh, feedback of course i rebel number one number two if the government of india believes that it needs a special fund for defense and security i ask the question which central government in which country in the world doesn't automatically look at defense and internal security as its own job what were they doing from independence till now all they're doing is finding a back door way to take some money away from the states it's ridiculous to say you need a separate bucket for that all along it's been looked after by the center from its share of the tax finally i you know mr somnath and the expenditure secretary is a tamil nadu cadre officer and i have had the chance to interact with him a few times uh, a learned man you can make anything look like anything right you 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 want to make a borrowing you have to balance the fact that you want the government balance sheet to look decent and your rating to look decent and yet you want to raise money and yet you have to do do fiscal stimulus i mean that's what bankers do day in and day out it's yep. not complicated it all depends on your attitude if you believe you know all the answers if you believe you are the omnipotent all seeing all knowing and you are going to impose on others based on the limited you know view that any one human being or three human beings have you will fail you know you could have easily resolved this gst dispute with exactly the same thing that you've done now which is you make the center basically wrap a borrowing from you know, what have they done they basically monetized it because they've taken it as a loan from the rbi they could, yeah. you know mr somnathan has been writing books about derivatives we could have written this 100 different ways without having one disagreement and mm -hmm. had the same risk net and had a conversation with the rating agencies and explained that this is what we do i mean we i i i came out of wall street during the era of the kind of credit derivative and securitized risk and globalization boom you can make anything look like anything and get it rated anything so yeah. it is the attitude i think that starts the problem but the point you made i think is a crucial point mm -hmm. is that we have to have a mechanism for the states to cooperate with each other without yeah. depending on big brother to be the link and yeah. i think if you take places like the states like the united states because i lived there for 20 years of my life i know it best there you have these mechanisms you have a, a conference of congressmen or mm. conference of state senators where people from different state governments elected officials come together and you have a free exchange of ideas and you can help each other go and do this now we have you know think tanks and ngos like prs legislative research in delhi that try to do some of this but mm. there ought to be really a much more official government to government uh, mechanism where the states can easily help each other with their respective knowledge and skills after all there's a huge migrant worker uh, kind of net surplus net uh, donation uh, mm. you know net demand net uh, donation uh, equation surely mm. it would behoove us to work well with those where we know our uh, labor is coming from and facilitate the quality of their life here in the yeah. sense that one of the rare things is uh, india is that we don't have permanent migration we have temporary migration which creates yeah. a lot of quality of life problems but were we to have a state to state interaction we could yeah. alleviate a lot of those quality of life problems so i just want to make the point that when the 15th finance commission came to chennai mm -hmm. for hearings and in fact mr somnathan was then the kind of sherpa i asked two three questions i said how do you define populist is mm -hmm. mnreg a populist is giving gas cylinders populist in tamil mm. nadu we give free laptops and we give free cycles which is populist mm. how do you get to decide what is populist where you mm. are on the economic spectrum will tell you what subsidies and what grants you give we see yeah. there is investment so mm. there is no way that there is a populist definition universal to all number one number two this notion that uh, the the progress towards the center's goals should be the basis for grants is really ludicrous some yeah. of the center's goals were met by us in 1975 100% mm. rural electrification or roads or whatever we all the rich states passed 20 years ago how will yeah. you then penalize us for not making progress on something we are at 100% so this yeah. notion that you can somehow set a one size fits all yeah somewhere in delhi and yeah. make that apply for the whole country is just ridiculous anybody with any understanding of complexity forget fairness forget uh, you know constitution the complexity of of execution or mm. the variability in current status tells you that simply will not work so yeah. i think that this is a the basic breaking point of if you do not get uh, you know though professor rao made the distinction that there's a difference between federalism and decentralization mm. then they are also correlated right i mean federalism calls for some de decentralization whether it's pull back tomorrow or not 
And hmm. unless you start being realistic about what can be achieved at what level, uh, you will continue to find that you give away Swachh Bharat grants and Krish Kalyan grants and they don't get utilized. Because yep. even if the building is put, they don't have water. Or if yep. you send money for whitewashing schools, they only have, uh, what do you say, thatched schools with no walls to whitewash. So yep. I, I think it is the only way forward is federalism, including decentralization, not just of the expenditure side, but also of the revenue side. Mm. And I hope that you are right in the sense that the courts have that uh, you know, broader perspective, though today it may be uh, missing from view, that sure. they will revert to that at some point. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think on that note, uh, it sort of perfectly captures what we have discussed over the course of one hour. And I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Tyagarajan for sparing time uh, from his busy schedule to come and speak to us. I think it was a wonderful perspective that we got and, I, and I'm sure we've all gone back much more enriched for what we've heard from you, sir. And I'd like to thank you all for listening in.